Hello, hello to the curious and the pessimistic. Welcome back to Bumblebee, where today we're getting gloomy and doomy, talking about some of our world's top 10 worst times to be alive in history. Let's start at a time where it wasn't even possible for us to be alive, 252 million years ago, AKA the Permian Triassic extinction. There's a reason it was dubbed the great dying. Of all extinctions, our planet is faced by this point, and there has been quite a few. They didn't have the effect of the Triassic. Marine invertebrates were hit particularly hard by this extinction, especially trilobites, which were finally killed off entirely, having survived two prior world computer errors. But you don't get the nickname like the Great Dying for playing favorites. Almost no form of life was spared by this extinction, which caused the disappearance of more than 95% of marine species and upwards of 70% of land-dwelling vertebrates. So many species were wiped out by this mass extinction, it took more than 10 million years to recover from the huge blow to global biodiversity. This extinction is thought to be be the result of a gradual change in climate, followed by a sudden catastrophe. Science, religion, pick your poison, because being under a tens rule would be one of the worst times to be alive in ancient Egypt. Perspective goggles at the ready all. Let's say you live in ancient Egypt. The worship of your deities isn't just casual, it's essential. They create and support the world, they raise the sun. So you sacrifice animals, attend rituals and services, and pray. And everyone shares this opinion. You and your community work hard as a team to keep the gods happy certain ones more than others. But one day a new pharaoh decides only one god is worthy of attention and nobody's ever done that before. Nobody's ever snuffed the other gods and you and your people watch in pant pissing terror as he destroys their monuments and memories. Since your gods are real to you, this is surely a perilous death and afterlife sentence, would it not be? Pharaoh Akhenaten's promotion of the Aten cult was obsessive. He changed his name and redirected revenue from Egypt's temples into the Aten cult only. In his fifth year of reign, Akhenaten planned to create a new cult arena and chose a site near Cairo. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into the desolate wasteland, and based off of the bones of the people in the town cemetery forced to build it, more than two-thirds of his workers broke their bodies while working, and a good third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished, and Dummy didn't think it through when he forced monotheism, because the temples of Egypt were the nation's socio-economic cultural hubs. When stripped of authority power, they closed down, and he caused Egypt's biggest reception. Let's get niche. Post Brennius sacking Rome. So, when Brennius' Gauls sacked the Eternal City, Rome was not yet a dominant imperial power. The Republic wasn't even a respectable regional force, it was just another small power amongst many in Italy. Brennius' Gauls broke through the outer wall and pinned the Romans up on the hills while they burned the rest of the city. In the end, Rome would pay a massive indemnity in precious metals to the Gallics to get them the F off. When the Romans brought the agreed upon amount to the handover ceremony, Brennus abruptly changed his mind by throwing his swords on the scale and demanded more. The Romans protested and Brennus simply said woe to the vanquished, took the last what they had and a bunch of their virgin women. The Gauls were then gone, but so was nearly all of the former Roman capital. The surviving inhabitants descended the hill to see the heaping piles of rubble and bloody bodies where their homes once stood. Reportedly, there was a serious talks of pulling an Alba Longa and abandoning the site, going off to live in B. At this darkest moment, they chose to stay. Hungry, poor, and destitute, just as they had been in the founding days of the city, the residents rebuilt the city blocks one by one and only increased their death count in the process. Partisans and plebeians worked side by side, all divisions and class forgotten. Now for the kings conquesting the Mings. What started as a relatively small rebellion in northeastern China ultimately resulted in one of the country's deadliest conflicts as well as one of the deadliest wars in history. The transition from the Qing dynasty over to the Ming dynasty, also called the Manchu invasion, was anything but peaceful. The rebellion was waged for over 60 years from 1618 to 1618. 1683 and resulted in the death of 25 million people. The Ming Dynasty had already been struggling. Starvation, famine, plague, and drought are all hitting them hard as hell, so peasants began to revolt. Then, April 1618, when the Jurchen tribal leader, Nurhashi, issued a proclamation listing seven grievances against the reigning Ming Dynasty. Then, the Ming Dynasty leaders refused to pay these tributes back to Nurhashi because he's some random guy, and he declared himself the founder of the Qing Dynasty and set in on attacking and taking over the entire everything. So in 1640, ma revolting masses who were starving, unable to pay their taxes, and no longer in fear of the frequently defeated Chinese army, began to form rebellions. The Chinese military, caught between fruitless efforts to deal with the Manchu raiders from the north and huge peasant revolts in the provinces, essentially fell apart. On April 21st of 1644, Beijing fell to a rebel army, and the last Ming emperor took his life in a tree. When Li Ziechen moved against him, Ming general Wu Sangu shifted his alliance to 
to the Manchus, and together they stop Li Qingzi from taking the throne. On June 6, the Manchus and the Wu entered the capital and proclaimed the young Shunzi Emperor as Emperor of China. Now, swinging on over to Japan, we've got the nightmarish hell, Sengoku period. Life in Sengoku period, aka the Warring Provinces, which spanned from the 100-ish years of 1467 to 1600, was all about surviving the opposing factions, regularly raiding villages and towns for supplies, endless battles at all hours, bodily violation, and starvation. The period opens into challenging political context. Two courts have just torn apart to establish their legitimacy. The southern court, favorable to the domination of the emperor, and the northern court, supporter of the shogun. So, the power is waning and the peasant revolts break out. Weakness of the shogunate is felt in the heads of the large families. The daimyo are as gradually assert themselves as the supreme authority in the region. These lords enforce their orders to the samurai who owe them in full allegiance and therefore will commit any atrocity. This fragmented power quickly led to a civil war, the War of Onin, which you'll be learning about in the next point, and ended with the exhaustion of the forces involved and famine severely affecting the population. The Onin War got the ball rolling for the warring provinces, so let's talk about Japan's biggest war. Eight-year-old Ashikaga Yoshimasa is smacked onto the throne while officials oversaw the government on his behalf. He never learns how to, nor is interested in governing. Yoshimasa devoted himself to enjoying his hobbies as he aged instead. High culture, fine arts, wanting to retire ASAP. So he needed an heir. Since he didn't have any children, he appointed his brother, Yoshimi, to be the new shogun, with Hosokawa Katsumoto as regent. But then his wife, Hino Tomiko, the head of the Hino clan, became pregnant and gave birth to a son, Yoshihisha. So, because Tomiko wanted her son to be the next shogun, Tomiko contacted Yamana Sozen to ask for his support. And just like that, government splits between Hosokawa and Sozen sides. And soon every major clan in Japan is on one side or the other. At last in 1467, samurai clans and armies from all over gather in Kyoto, approximately 28,000 individuals, and the Onan War began. Both sides were pillaging and burning each other's homes, buildings were being destroyed to punish enemies, women violated, innocents killed, all to make space for fighting. There was only one person who could stop this, Ashikaga Yoshimasa. After all, he's the reason the war began because he needed a successor. Was it going to be Yoshimi or Yoshihashi? Instead, Yoshimasa simply enjoyed his time writing poetry and ignored all going on. And in addition, rather than trying to stop the war, his wife Hino Tomiko earned a fortune by loaning money for the war. The Onan War seemed to have no end in sight, even when Hosokawa died and Sozen died at the same time from illness. Even when Yoshihisa is appointed the next shogun, it didn't stop. It lasted a total of 11 years and there was no victor. Fast forward a few years and let's DeLorean our way to 17th century England, just an awful time period with some of the most awful people. A bunch of sexless, wool clan fanatics thinking the devil was hiding in every moldy wheat stalk and ladies pair of panties. It was a time of open graves, raining feces, and no better encapsulated than in Colin Woodard's biography Republic of Pirates. Life in poor districts of London was dirty and dangerous. People often lived in 15 or 20 people in a room, in a cold, dimly lit, unstable house. There was no organized trash collection, so chamber pots were dumped out windows, splattering everyone and everything in the streets below. Manure from horses and other livestock piles up in thoroughfares, as does the corpses of the animals themselves. London's frequent rains carry away some of this muck, but it made for an overpowering stench, and the churchyards are even worse, because paupers are buried in mass graves, which remain open until it's full. Cold weather brought its own atmospheric hazards, as what little home heating there was came from burning poor quality coal. Disease is rampant. 8,000 people moved to London each year, but the influx barely kept up with the mortality rate. Food poisoning and dysentery carried off a average of 1,000 a year, and more than 8,000 were consumed by fevers and convulsions. Measles and smallpox killed 1,000 more, most of whom were already ravaged by rickets and intestinal worms. Large numbers of hungry, begraggled youth, street urchins roamed the streets together in bands called blackguards, so called because they would shine the boots of Calverly men for small change. From beggary, they proceed to theft, said a London commoner, and from theft to the gallows. In Australia, colonization will always be remembered as the killing times. Australia is working pretty hard on the indigenous education of its residents and immigrants. Reconciliation Australia's 2019 barometer of attitudes to indigenous people found that 70% of Australians accept and know that indigenous people were subjected to mass killings, incarceration, and stripped of land and rights. In Canada, however, more than half the people you'll meet in Toronto don't know what a residential school is. And the closest one is less than an hour from where we're standing now. There is more than 10,000 indigenous and Torres Strait Islanders' lives lost in more than 
400 mass killings over 140 years, and all as a part of a state-sanctioned and organized attempt to eradicate indigenous peoples in Australia. The effort started in 1794 with British soldiers escalating to police and then to settlers all acting together. These tactics were employed without repercussion as late as 1926. The average number of deaths of indigenous people in each conflict increased, meanwhile from the early 1900s, casualties among the settlers ended entirely. Preliminary data from Queensland shows that between 1859 and 1915 an average of 34 people were killed in each attack. There are at least 9 known cases of deliberate poisoning of flour given to indigenous people as well, and there were efforts to cover up atrocities. In 1927, a royal commission into the Forest River mass killing concluded a police party had killed at least 11 people and burned their bodies in makeshift ovens. These next two on the countdown are a hard tie for first place in my mind. I'm going to start with the Century of Humiliation, a title given to the 110 year period of Chinese desecration at the hands of violent outsiders. It started with the Qing Dynasty when they lost the poppy war to the British Empire in 1839. The Qing government tried to ban the elusive poppy powder and the Brits were quite literally forcing it on them like a dare commercial setup. But then it started to be smuggled in illegally through India and eventually the Chinese had enough and they destroyed a bunch of the British poppy powder by dumping it into harbors, to which the Brits claimed they destroyed their property and war happened. China is forced to admit defeat and forced to sign very unequal treaties and reparations to Britain in the form of Hong Kong. Over the next few decades, China is split up and divided among the European powers. Russia took Tuva and parts of Mongolia and a large portion of the Manchuria. Germans took King Dao, Japan took Taiwan, Saklan, and Korea. China was being colonized and powerless to stop it. Qing Dynasty falls in 1912 from civil war and another follows suit, but then World War II came around, civil war stopped, and both sides worked together to fight, but then what happens in Nanjing completely rattles the nation. Japan is defeated by America and later war is over. Then China's plunged again into civil war due to power hungry rulers. After four years of fighting, it was over. The Republic had fled and the country was reunified. Then on October 1st, 1949, Mayo gave his famous speech at Tiananmen Square announcing the launch of his new government. And now for the other Thai member, the younger Dryas. This scary black mat represents one of the single worst if not worst times and places to be alive. It's a boundary layer found between three continents, between 10,800 BC to 9600 BC. It starts with a 2000 year long period of global warming as our species emerged from the depths of an ice age and started to thrive in the age of plenty. Massive sheets of ice covering North America and Northern Europe, approximately two miles thick, did remain melting away. The picture you see on screen shows you the European ice sheet at the end of the ice age. Anyway, spring happened, lands fertile, water plentiful, and a strange star appears with a light, long trail, every day growing larger and larger and larger. The humans alive must have marveled at it, maybe worshipped it, right up until the shattering asteroid smashed into North America and Europe's ice sheets. Check out this impact field. Goes without saying that being anywhere in that vicinity would have been horrific. The energy released was equivalent to every giant weapon of destruction the governments are packing, simultaneously going off at once. It triggered widespread wildfires, global cooling, sea levels rose at approximately 400 feet. Large animals go extinct, and the Clovis culture, the dominant population at the time, literally vanished from fossil records. And it's still unclear whether the impact occurred. Not enough proof for the sciencey types, I guess. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.